Good morning. Welcome to Greenfield this morning. Good to see many faces here this morning. I know there's many of you joining us online, and I know that uh, it's good to see newer faces here as well. So we're glad that uh, you can join us from wherever you are this morning. And so we are grateful that we do get to do this. Um, uh, we are grateful that we have um, the opportunity to worship. And so this morning we're going to do that. I'm going to invite you to stand for our call to worship. And our call to worship comes from Psalm 100 this morning. It says, shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is good. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues for all generations. And so this morning, we just want to, um, yeah, we want to worship this morning, that our hearts would be filled, um, that our souls will uh, be uplifted. And we also know that there's those, many of you, many of you that, are, that can't maybe sing some of these songs this morning. And we ask for those around us to carry uh, the rest of us as well. And so... Uh, we invite you to join with us, and uh, looking forward to our our uh, opportunity just to worship this morning. Come, thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious song that Sung by flaming tongues above Praise a mountain fixed upon it Mount of thy redeemed Oh, God. 
take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. And praise to the Lord. comfortable doing. everyone. This Wednesday is a special Wednesday called Ash Wednesday. Does anyone know what Ash Wednesday is? Well, Ash Wednesday is the start of Lent. Now, Lent is what we call the 40 days before Easter, and it's a time when we try to intentionally focus on God and our relationship with Him. Sometimes we do this by getting rid of distractions or giving something up. Sometimes you'll hear, hear people say, I'm giving up TV or video games or junk food for Lent. When they do this, they are giving up the attachment that they have to that thing for 40 days and focusing on God instead. So why is this Wednesday called Ash Wednesday? Well, since Ash Wednesday is the start of Lent, this special time where we want to focus on God, we want to begin Lent by repenting. Repenting means thinking about the bad things that we've done, the things that block us from having a relationship with God, and asking God to forgive us for those things so that we can be in a relationship with Him. So to symbolize this repentance, some people have a cross drawn on their forehead using ash. And this cross is a reminder of our repentance, God's forgiveness, and the continuing call to live our lives as followers of Jesus. Have a great week, everyone.
Good morning to everyone at home and those gathered here. Would you please join me in prayer? Dear God, we've come together in person and online to worship you. Thank you for the incredible privilege that we have each week to gather and connect as a family of faith in your holy presence. Thank you that each Sunday you call us into dialogue with you. You speak words of life to us, and we respond in praise, gratitude, and obedience. Let us be renewed in Christ this Sunday and every day as we worship you, that we might live lives that please you in every way. And may the light of Christ shine brighter than ever in our homes, workplaces, communities, and anywhere in the world you will send us. Heavenly Father, we lift up to you all those who are facing various illnesses. We pray for the sickness amongst our families, our church family, our neighborhoods, and our world. We pray for those suffering from COVID. We pray for those suffering from cancer. We pray for those suffering from heart concerns. We pray for those suffering from any form of sickness or ailment. If it is your will, we pray that you will heal them, Lord. We ask that you be with them, comfort them, and provide them with peace. Give them hope and courage they need today and every day. Comfort their pain, calm their fears, and surround them with your spirit and peace. Be with their families that are struggling as they watch their loved ones suffer. Provide them with love and a sense of hope. God, we pray that you heal our world from physical and mental afflictions. Holy Father, you are a God of justice. You care for those who are oppressed. You love those who are marginalized. We pray for justice and redemption in this world. Help us to know what is wrong and what is right. Help this world to know what is wrong and what is right. Provide peace and hope to those who are suffering from injustice. Show them that you are there and that you care for them and that you will make all things right. God, we pray for a world full of love and compassion, understanding and care. Dear God, today more than ever, our hearts are breaking and we cry out to you as our world is torn apart with war and violence. We pray for those who are suffering from the results of the war and violence in the Ukraine. We pray for the people of Ukraine, and we pray you provide them with both physical and mental protection, support, and healing. We pray for those with power over war or peace, for wisdom, discernment, and compassion to guide their decisions. We pray for an end to these wars and acts of violence. We pray for peace for your protection, for redemption, for miracles of your presence through this. We pray for all of those who are reaching out to provide care and support in so many ways, including medical aid, food, and shelter, to so many fleeing and injured. Thank you for the compassion of so many through this time. And Lord, at times we feel helpless at this distance. Please provide us your encouragement as we continue to pray unceasingly for peace. We pray for an end to all the division between individuals, groups, and nations. We pray for your healing. We pray for an end to all the trauma and hurting. We pray for your love to reign over all. But Lord, in the midst of this, we, like David, are able to say, in spite of all, we trust in you. You are our God. Our times are in your hands. We trust in your unfailing love. We know that when we cry out to you, Lord, that you will deliver us. Lord, in all the challenges that lie ahead, help us to trust in you. Help us to rely on you and your power as we now pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory 
forever and ever. Amen. invite you to stand for these next couple of songs and this next one is a little bit uh, we've done it a few times but it's just about inviting the Holy Spirit to come and so Holy Spirit we just invite you this morning and come and dwell in the space we've made you can have our hearts can have your ways cause we're tearing down all the walls we've built be welcome now be welcome here we open up the doors we open up the doors we open up the doors and let you in we open up the doors we open up the doors. We open up the doors and let you in. Come and move.
when you move, darkness runs for cover. When you move, no one's turned away. Cause where you are, fear turns into praises. Justice roll on like a river. Let worship turn into revival. Lord, lead us back to you. When you move, the outcast finds a Age four to grade six, you're dismissed to Sunday school. There's a whole group of you that are very loud and, and giggling in my corner, but that was good. It was very fun. Um, before I do our scripture reading this morning, I also wanted to uh, 
highlight that just as Joella was talking about in the kids feature, this coming Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. And Ash Wednesday is this very important time in the church calendar that's, that kicks off the season of Lent. And we have an Ash Wednesday service here at the church at 7 o'clock. There is an option to live stream it, but I truly encourage you to come. Especially those of you, you, you guys are here, but like come if you're at home too, because it's a really good thing to experience in person and you can receive the ashes and we're going to spend some time uh, focusing our hearts in preparation for the for Jesus, the amazing thing that Jesus is going to do, his death and resurrection. And Lent is a time of, of returning our hearts to God. And so we start Lent with confession, with turning our hearts to focus on Jesus Christ. And so I strongly invite all of you to come. If you're at home, I encourage you to come and participate in person because it's really a good time uh, to focus and do that. And it's also, I have so much to say, but I've been planning the service, so I'm really excited. But it's also, it coincides with the season of, of spring, and there's something about that change of season as we go from the dark dreariness into the light and, and the beauty of spring and summer months that are coming. Hard to believe sometimes, but they are. And that change and that beauty just shows us what God is capable of, that transformation and the change and the move from dark to light. So please come on Wednesday for Ash Wednesday service at 7 o'clock. And now for a scripture reading, and I'll try to do it as expressively as we had last week. It is a selection of verses from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. For do I, I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I try to please everyone in every way. For I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Thanks, Stephanie. So this week we're continuing um, and kind of finishing off this chunk of scripture that we've been uh, talking about that's dealing with food sacrifice to idols. And, and so here, uh, today we're looking at, um, you know, Paul kind of shifts gears, right? Like he's been talking about, uh, in Corinth, they've been going to the temples uh, to the pagan temples, and they've been participating in the feasts there. And, and last week, we looked at Paul, sort of how Paul corrects their attitude and how he shifts them from thinking, okay, so is this really something that's beneficial? Right? Is this something that's building up your brother and sister? Because the issue was that for some in their congregation, that was a big stumbling block. And so Paul was trying to change your attitude to get people to think about, well, how is my actions, my conduct, how does that impact the, 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 the conscience of others in the congregation? And so it's this principle of the stumbling block. So that's what Paul was dealing with last week. And this week, um, in this continuation, he kind of, uh, he deals with it from a different angle where it wasn't just that going to these pagan temples and participating in the meals there, that, that Paul doesn't just consider this a disputable matter. 
It's not a matter of indifference. But Paul actually here, in today's passage, highlights that there's more going on when you go into the temples um, and, you, and you participate in the sacrifice that's there. And he sort of draws these analogies. And so um, in today's passage, he talks, uh, you know, first he kind of goes looking at the Old Testament um, and he sort of highlights some warnings from ancient Israel, right, that he sort of draws on, especially the wilderness generation, right? Just after they had come, God had delivered them and brought them out of Egypt and then they sort of wandered around and they were disobedient, they grumbled a lot, um, and so he draws some lessons from there. And then he gets to the sort of the meat of this passage where he deals with them participating in the temple worship, these pagan temples, and he, at this point he says that this is idolatry and, and it's not compatible with life as a Christ follower. So this is, you know, so... You know, on the one hand, Paul sort of is very flexible and he can sort of deal with different situations and realize that the context, but then in this particular case, he highlights that this goes too far. And so he comes down very strongly against his participating in the temple meals. And then at the end of this chapter, he sort of shifts gears again and he deals with eating marketplace food. Right? So food that may have come from the temples, may have been butchered by a priest, but then is not eaten in the temple context as part of a sacrificial meal, but is just eaten in the home. And here he says, well, then it matters you know, who you're eating it with, what questions are raised. So like in these chapters, Paul is really dealing with how we are to live our lives as Christ followers um, and think about the other and so he's kind of dealing with these disputable matters that we face, and our disputable matters are going to be different in our culture than 2,000 years ago. But then also, at what point does something shift from being a disputable matter or a matter of indifference to being an absolute? And so it's a good case study um, in this regard. And then at the end, he just provides some concluding exhortations that wraps up this whole uh, you know, three chapters. Of, of Corinthians. So first he gives some warnings, okay? And, and he, he, he sort of highlights and he makes this analogy with ancient Israel, right? And he sort of, he, this is sort of typology it's referred to. Um, and he says that the Israelites, right? The ancient Israelites, like the Corinthians, were united through a common experience of deliverance through water, Right? He refers to the exodus from Egypt as his baptism when they went through the Red Sea. You know, in the same way how the Christ followers at Corinth were baptized. Right? And, so, and then he also then talks about how they ate the same spiritual food. Um, and then here he's drawing an illusion, an analogy with communion. And so he's making this general kind of connection with the ancient Israelites and their current practice. And, and so he, he highlights here that in the same way that the Israelites, and if you read those stories, you know, in, at the end of the book of Exodus and in the book of Numbers, you see again and again how they grumbled, how they sort of had factionalism, how they divided over, they, they didn't trust their leaders, and there's all this sort of issues, and also things like um, idolatry and sexual immorality, all these sorts of issues. And he says that the Israelites, too, experienced this same sort of stuff that the Corinthian church was experiencing, and they faced God's judgment. And so this is a strong warning that Paul's giving them. He says, guys, you need to really think about what you're doing, and that participating uh, in going to the temples um, and eating and feasting there has more implications than maybe you think. And as well as some of the other divisions that we've heard about all throughout this letter. And then, so he gives us general analogy at first, and then he sort of gives some specific, where he appeals to particular passages in the Old Testament. And he does this through um, typology, and he says, now these things occurred as examples, is the way the NIV translates it. In Greek, it's tupos, it's type. These things were types to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things 
as they did. And he also repeats this at the end of the section in verse 11. But typology is where you make a connection. And this is something you find throughout the New Testament, that the different New Testament authors will use typology, where you make a connection with, with a person or a place or a thing or an event or an institution in the Old Testament, and you apply it by analogy to something in the New Testament, something in the life of the church. And so this is something which you see happen frequently, and this is specifically what Paul is doing here. And he uses this method of typology, of making this connection, and saying, we need to learn from what happened to the ancient Israelites, to our ancestors, you know, to the, to the people of God in the Old Testament times. We need to learn from their example so that we don't go down the same path. And so he gives four specific warnings. And this is something which I have to admit, I get fascinated about stuff like this because he's quoting these passages in the Old Testament. Usually he's quoting them in the Greek, right? So he's talking about the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint translation, and there's all these textual you know, issues and what exactly he's referring to, and I get all excited about that, but I won't bore you with all those details. If you want to talk about some of this stuff, I'd be happy to um, and, and give you more than your fill of it. But, so, but I just want to sort of highlight some of the main points here. And so the first one, of course, that he appeals to is the, the sort of the example par excellence. Within the Old Testament of idolatry is, is the golden calf incident. Right here you have the Israelites. They're delivered from Egypt. God led them out of Egypt with a mighty arm. And he, they go and they go to Mount Sinai. And they're waiting there because Moses is up on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments. And no sooner than Moses was gone is that they were kind of getting bored. And they were thinking, well, you know, Moses is gone. Let's make an idol. Always a good thing to do. No. Okay, so this is the example par excellence. And so here, you know, uh, Paul highlights this. He says, do not be idolaters. As some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. And so the particular quote from Exodus 32 that Paul gives is, is notice that how it highlights not sort of the, the making of the golden calf or anything like that but it highlights their participation and their eating and drinking in association with this idolatry, right? So he's making this connection with what's going on at Corinth at that time. And so that's the first example that he gives. And then he draws another example, and this is where you have this sexual immorality of the Israelites. They were wandering in the desert, and they sort of got into a little bit of issues with the Midianites, Right? And so it's a specific case where they started worshiping Baal, Peor, which is one of the Canaanite gods that was very common and was always a thorn in Israel's flesh at that time. <clears throat> and so Paul cites then from Numbers 25, uh, and he says that we should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. And so he's, again, showing the consequences of idolatry and sexual immorality, which are often associated in the Old Testament and even within Judaism at the time of Paul and, and Jesus. And there seems to be something going on even when they go to the pagan temples to feast that you know, some thought that you know, a lot of the worship of the pagan temples in, in Greco-Roman times involved also sexual play and things like that. So it's just full of these bad associations. And then he gives another third example where he, he talks about testing God. He says, we should not test Christ, as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. Okay, and, and this probably is referring to Numbers 21, where they were grumbling, and what were they grumbling about? Well, food and water, and this sort of stuff, which is connected again with the context of Corinth. They were, they were grumbling about that, and they were putting God to the test, and then God sent snakes and killed them, and it's a whole thing. And, and I'm not going to get into all the issues of, of how we understand 
uh, judgment and how God judged back in the Old Testament times. Um, but I will say that, that, that right now is this time of grace where we're all invited and called to come to God, um, and judgment is something which is yet future. But this is another example where they were grumbling, they were testing God, they were being unfaithful, and then they were judged. And then the final one um, is, is, again, a little obscure. Um, it says, And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. If you try to find exactly what Paul is referring to here, you don't find it, right? Like there's no reference in all the grumbling that the the wilderness generation did in the book of Numbers in the Old Testament. And there's lots of that, lots of different examples that you could appeal to. There's no case where it it explicitly refers to, to the destroying angel you know, killing them. Um, So it seems that most people think this is a general reference, you know, like it talks about in in the Exodus and later on with uh, David and and in Chronicles, it refers to this destroying angel. And the idea here is just, this is how God carries out judgment, right? It's through his destroying angel, through the angel of death, this sort of stuff. So Paul makes these four warnings, these four sort of appeals to the Old Testament and specifically the the wilderness generation. And the main point is to flee from such idolatry. And it's significant that all of these incidents that he refers to are associated with idolatry, associated with sexual immorality, factionalism, and food. The the exact things that Paul has been dealing with, not only in these three chapters, but also in chapter 6 and in chapter 4 and 3 throughout the book of Corinthians. And so he's dealing with all these issues and he's saying that they need to learn from the example, you know, from this wilderness generation and, and that they need to flee from idolatry and they need to not be arrogant. And so it's a little bit of a gut check where he says, so if you think you're standing firm, if you think you're impervious to all this sort of stuff that's going on and that you can go to the pagan temples and you can participate in the meals there and it's not going to, you know, harm you, well, he says, you know, be careful that you don't fall. And so this passage, sir, you can see how it builds up. And Paul, I think, is, is sort of frustrated with them and you know, they've been criticizing him, criticizing his approach. They've been sort of, you know, living in ways that, that probably are not good and that are causing division in their church and in their congregation. And now he's sort of, you know, hit the wall and he's saying, guys, you need to pay attention. And then he transitions in verse 13 and verse 14 to this next section where he deals directly with the idolatry of going to these pagan temples. But first he gives this verse, which is a much-loved verse, which I assume that most of us know and maybe have memorized. Right In verse 13 he says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to humankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Now this is a a, a favorite verse, you know, from Corinthians. One of many, but it is one that, you know, that I assume many of you have heard of. One of the challenges in our regular interpretation of it and how it's applied is that it's generally taken right out of context. Right, so I, I do want to kind of put it back in the context of Corinthians um, you know, to, to help us understand why Paul mentions this exactly here. And, and the thing is, in this context, he's not talking about general suffering, right? There's memes that, that kind of go around how, how God will, uh, you know, not give you more than you can bear in life, okay? Um, and I think those are, that, that's not what this passage is referring to. That's taking something that's referring specifically to temptations to sin and applying it to everything that we might face in life. And, and, uh, and I don't think that's healthy. 
to do that. So that's misquoting it and taking it out of context. But so it's not this idea, some, some saccharine, saccharine sort of idea of God will not give you more than you can handle. But it's about temptation to idolatry, temptation to divisiveness, temptation to grumbling, temptation to break the covenant that you made with our God. And so, on the one hand, it's a reminder of God's faithfulness, right? That God is faithful. And even when we are tempted to break covenant, when we are tempted to sin, to, to, sort of, to go our own way, to live our lives, to whatever it might be in our context, that this passage highlights that God is faithful, and that he will provide an exit path. He will provide us a way to endure the temptation. And what's significant in this particular case with the Corinthians is that you know the way out for them is not looking for a way in to participate, <coughs> not COVID, um, to participate, but just, just uh, I need a drink of water, but to participate in these pagan feasts. And so he's saying that, you know, in, in one way he's saying to them, guys, you know what? I will provide a way out. If, I know you're tempted. I know it's good for, for business associations, for connections in your culture, but there's really a simple solution in this case. Don't go. Right? And he then sort of highlights right after this, and he says, you know, therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. You don't need to go to these pagan temples and participate in the feasts there. Just don't do it. And this is the way out that God has provided them. And so when he shifts gears there, he, he, he provides a second argument about why they shouldn't participate. So it's, it's sort of irrelevant of the whole question of how um, your actions impact your brother and sister in Christ, which is important that he talked about last week. But now he says, think of what impact it has on your own spiritual life by doing this. Um, and so he implies that there's more to going to these feasts than just eating. That there's something else going on. And he draws this connection and he provides two illustrations. One of them is with communion, with the practice of the Lord's Supper. And he says that, that there's this special connection and he uses the, the Greek word koinonia, right? Which is this, this Greek word that highlights the, the communion, that's why we call the Lord's Supper communion. The communion that we have when we come together to, to remember the death of Jesus and that we, when we take the bread and when we eat the cup, <laughs> take the cup and eat the bread, right? That, that there's something that happens that's both a vertical level with God, right? Where we identify with Christ in his death both as a source of our reconciliation with God as well as an example of how we should live in the world. Right? But then it also highlights this horizontal connection that we're brothers and sisters in Christ. That when we come to Christ that we're incorporated into his body. And so there's something, when we celebrate communion, it's not just a mere symbol that we, you know, when we take the cup and when we take the bread, but there's more going on. There's this spiritual communion between God and between one another. And then he also draws an illustration from the Old Testament from where he talks about their sacrificial system. And when an ancient Israelite, when they would go to the temple and they would sacrifice an animal for their sin, that this again was participating, that you would put your hand on the animal and, and sort of make this identification with it as it was sacrificed. And then there would also be eating that you would, you know, depending on the type of sacrifice, that you would, uh, some of it would be burnt off as an offering to God, but then others would be eaten and shared 
with those that came along with you. And so there's a sense that, you know, both in communion and the Lord's Supper, and then when he looks at the Old Testament, their sacrificial system, that there's more going on than just merely eating. And then he sort of connects the dots for them, and he applies it to their situation. And he says, guys, when you go to the temples, with these pagan temples, and you participate in their feasts, that more is going on than meets the eye. And he says, he, he, it's not about the food, right? Earlier in last week, he said, no, all food is, is, is good, right? That's not the issue. And he says, it's not even about the idols, right? That we recognize there's only one true God. But then he sort of highlights and says that there's this reality of demonic, there's this re, demonic presence at these pagan sacrifices. And here he quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 17, and he's quoting from the Septuagint from the Greek, you know, where he says, the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons. So it's not just benign, but there's, you know, something more going on. And they're not sacrificed to God. And his point is, is that he doesn't want them to be participating and be participants with demons. And by eating the meals at the pagan temples, that they were participants in the sacrifices. So, so they weren't doing the sacrifices themselves. Maybe they had no intention that they were going there and they were just, they recognized, I don't know, I worship, you know, God. The one true God is revealed in Jesus Christ. But none, whoa. Sorry. I'm just kind of, let's put it over there. Um, but, but that they were, they were still somehow, you know, by being there, being in that association, that they were sort of putting themselves in this situation that they shouldn't be. Now, for us in North America, you know, we don't talk about the devil a whole lot. We don't talk about demons. We probably don't think, you know, um, of the presence of, you know, demonic influence in our everyday life a whole lot. Okay, and that's something which... Um, is, is sort of on us a little bit in a very secular sort of Western worldview, okay? That in other places in the world, in the two-thirds world, uh, they see the reality of this a little bit more. But when we, when we read the Gospels, when we understand the Scripture and what it says about the devil, it's, the devil is, is very real, a personal malevolent force in this world. But we have to remember... And I think this is important, too, that we have to remember that Jesus, in his victory on the cross, has disabled these demonic forces and liberated people from their influence, right? So that, that they um, do not have, you know, it's nothing for us to be scared of or to be overly concerned with. In Colossians 1.13, Paul says, And having disarmed the powers and authorities, that Jesus made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. And then in 2.15, he says, the reason, uh, sorry, and then in 1 John 3.8, he says, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. So I'm not saying that we should be overly concerned with the reality of the demonic. We need to kind of keep it in balance and realize that Jesus Christ and his death on the cross and his resurrection, that he has disarmed and has defeated Satan. But nonetheless, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't avoid situations where there still could be demonic influence. And in the first century Corinth, going to the pagan temples where they're intentionally performing sacrifices to these pagan gods, that that was an example of an influence that Paul is saying that you shouldn't be associated with that. And as I mentioned already, Western Christians, you know, we need to learn that the demonic is not as remote as we would wish to believe. And, and there's this balance there. And I, and I, and I always think of C.S. Lewis's quote in the preface to the Screwtape Letters, 
right, where he says there are two equal and opposite errors which our race can fall into about the devils or about demons. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. And so somewhere between that is where we need to find ourselves. But I think that, that in this case, Paul was highlighting that this, when they were going to those pagan temples, that it wasn't just a matter of indifference. Oh, I have that quote on a slide. You can read it for yourself, sorry. Uh, page 9 of, in the preface to the screw tape letters. So he concludes then at this section, and, and, and so just to review, in chapter 8 he argued that the followers of Christ should not go to the pagan temples to participate in the ritual feasts, and, and there his motivation, the guide for them, is because a concern to act in love for one's weaker brother and sister. So that's still a concern for all of our behavior. But then in this chapter, he highlights and he adds an additional argument to his prohibition that in so doing is in fact idolatrous, that you're opening yourself up to sharing in the, in the, the, the table of demons, as he says. And, and so this is sort of how he sort of concludes this section. So you know, he would say that participation in the feasts in the pagan temples is incompatible with being a Christ follower. So they shouldn't do it. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons, he says in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 21. Now, the challenge, of course, for us in our culture, you know, what does this mean? Right, again, that I don't think that we should be blind to the reality of the demonic in our world. But on the other hand, we shouldn't look for it everywhere or see it everywhere as well. So after now establishing that, he now changes gears once again, and he deals with this idea of marketplace food. Okay, so he says that, no, you shouldn't go to these pagan temples. Okay, everyone's clear on that, Paul? Thumbs down on going to the pagan temples and participating in the food there. But when it comes to marketplace food, here he's talking about meat that may very well come from the temple, but was purchased in the market and was ate eaten at someone's home, or maybe you're invited to uh, someone's place and you eat it in their domicile. Um, and in this case, here he says that it is not something which uh, he prohibits 100%. But what he does at the very beginning of this is highlight the principle that he established earlier in chapter 8, and he, and he rephrases it, and he says that he wants him to start thinking, in, in this case, of eating marketplace food, he wants him to think about what it does for their weaker brother or sister. And he says, I have the right to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. So he applies this general principle. So in the matters of marketplace food, he says... It depends, right? And then he goes on and talks about that if someone, uh, if you're about to eat this food and someone mentions that, oh, yeah, by the way, this was sacrificed to, to you know, a, a pagan deity or, or a god, a Corinthian god at that time, then at that point, you probably shouldn't eat it, right? Because of the conscience of the person that mentioned it and maybe someone that you're with. And so here, this is where Paul is distinguishing between absolutes or essentials and non-essentials or disputable matters, right? So going to the temples and eating there, he said, that is an absolute. That's something that, they, that is not just a non-essential, as some of them were thinking, because it's a form of idolatry. But in terms of marketplace food, he's saying that this is a disputable matter, and in that case, it depends on the context, 
and who you're eating it with. So Paul allowed for eating marketplace food unless it caused someone to stumble. And, and he highlights you know, this general idea, these principles that he already established in chapter 8, where he says, no one should seek their own good but the good of others. So as Christians, we need to think about others in terms of our conduct. And then in, in verse 32, he highlights this stumbling block principle again, where he says, do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God. And this is much the same as what he talks about in Romans 14 and 15. So this is an important distinction that Paul makes here. And of course, the challenge for us is it's not always clear what is a disputable matter and what is an essential. And that's where the, the hard work needs to happen. And so a couple of conclusions then for today. First, in terms of temptation, you know, that we need to trust God's faithfulness to give a way out from the temptation and sin. You know, that there's many, you know, this is something that for, for many of us, there's, we will have our different temptations. There are different things, there are different things that we struggle with. And so I think we need to hang on, you know, to that verse that highlights that God is faithful and that he will give you a way out. But, you know, on the other hand, we need to take the way out that God provides. That we shouldn't put God to the test. And to continue to put ourselves in situations, you know, that will, you know, lead us to give in to temptation. So it's a very practical uh, thing that Paul highlights here. You know, that, that if, if X tempts you, then then try not to be in situations where you're going to have and be confronted by that temptation. The other thing, and as I highlighted too, is that we need to learn to discern the difference between disputable matters and these essentials and absolutes. Right? And here in, in these three chapters, Paul you know, makes that distinction. You know, he says, food doesn't matter. You know, that, that food sacrifice, you know, the idols don't matter because they're not real. But then he does make this distinction that going to the pagan temples where they're literally sacrificing the, the meat to a pagan deity and then eating it, that there there's something more going on. And so the challenge is in our context you know, how do you discern that difference? And I think it's important that it is talking about discernment because Paul was very flexible, right? As we saw last week, right? To the Jew, I became a Jew to save the Jews. To the Greek, I became Greek. To the weak, I became weak. That Paul was very flexible in his conduct and how he lived his life among different people in different contexts and that it, that it is a matter of discernment, that it's not, he's not talking about legalism. That there's no one hard and fast rule that's going to fit in every situation. And so we need to sort of understand the context and then apply it, you know, to our context and our situation. And then I think the, the big point from these three chapters and from really the whole book of Corinthians is that in all things... We are called to follow the self-sacrificial way of Christ's love and concern for others. That that should be our guiding point when we are considering how we live our lives in this world. And as Paul concludes, he says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And how do you do it for the glory of God? Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I try to please everyone in every way. For I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, 
so that they may be saved. And as Paul says at the end of this passage, that we are to follow his example as he follows the example of Christ. Amen. We invite you to stand for our closing song. Worthy of every song we could ever sing And worthy of all the praise we could ever bring And worthy of every breath
So the White Cross sessions start tomorrow morning at 9.30. So if you want to come and, and roll bandages or cut out patterns, that you can come here to the church building. It will be downstairs in the multi-purpose room. Um, we've already mentioned the Ash Wednesday service this Wednesday at 7. Um, and then I just want to make sort of a, a, a brief comment about masks and masking. Um, as you are probably all well aware, the provincial government yesterday announced that most of the COVID uh, guidelines are, are discontinuing as of March 1st. Um, we still have to wait to see what the City of Edmonton will do, because right now they still have a masking mandate in place. Um, <clears throat> but nonetheless, that no matter what they say, um, as the leadership of Greenfield, we've decided that for an interim period, that staff and volunteers um, will be required to mask. And as far as congregants, as far as others coming, um, we encourage you to mask, but we're not going to require it. And I think the key is, and I think something that we can learn from Corinthians, even these last two Sundays, where all of us, that um, our conduct should be guided by the self-sacrificial way of Christ's love and concern for others. And so that's something that you need to work out uh, for yourself. But yeah, I just wanted to sort of announce that in terms of, you know, what happens this week in regards to the different guidelines um, that we uh, want to be concerned for those that are vulnerable, those that are uncomfortable, uh, but we also want people back in the building too, right? Like there is something about gathering together as God's people that you know, the live stream is great. It, does, it, it, it is something which has been a truly a blessing during this time. But it doesn't replace, you know, coming together as God's people and, and having that support and that sort of interaction. So let's pray together. So Lord God, we, uh, we thank you, Lord, that for your great faithfulness, Lord, that you are faithful to us, that when we, when we face temptation, when we are tempted to, to, to fall into sin and to, to do things that we know are breaking covenant with you. And Lord, I just pray, uh, and, and, and I thank you for that you give us a way out, and I pray that we would see it in the midst of those times, and that we would have the courage and strength to take the way out that you provide for us. And Lord, I just thank you for your great example of love, that you so loved the world that you gave your one and only son who died on the cross for us, and that we can follow the example of Jesus in his self-sacrificial concern for others. We can follow the example of Paul in Scripture his concern for his weaker brother or sister, and that we can live lives that are characterized by love, that love for you, love for one another, and love for our neighbors. And Lord, give us wisdom to discern, you know, between something that is a disputable matter that we have freedom in and the, the, the essentials. And so, Lord, we thank you for this time, and, and Lord, I just pray that as we leave here today, that we would continue to, that you would continue to do the good work that you've started in us, and that you would strengthen us through the power of your Holy Spirit to do your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Go with God's blessing.